Today what we want to do uh, is finish up the semester. After today we'll have one more, a, a semester review. But this is the last regular lecture of the semester. What we wanted to do is talk about the international sector of the economy. Now we've already talked about international economics earlier on. If you remember, we talked about the production possibilities frontier and how that an, our nation could specialize in producing certain goods and trade with other nations. Those other nations would be specializing in producing goods and trade with us. And so um, we've already seen some of that uh, material. Uh, of course, the terms I think we've talked about uh, from time to time, uh, imports and exports. If the United States sells something to foreigners, we call that our exports. Uh, if we buy something from foreigners, that would be our imports. And so some of these concepts we've already talked about before. Uh, what we want to do is go on and extend that discussion of production and trade, uh, we want to extend that into uh, the foreign exchange markets uh, and, and certain concepts that maybe you've heard about uh, on television or read in the newspaper about, uh, such as the balance of trade and the balance of payments. We want to discuss some of those ideas as well. So uh, let me get the ball rolling here with just a simple diagram of uh, two-party exchange. You're already familiar with this. Uh, the way trade happens within the United States is maybe one person uh, sells goods, sends goods to the other, and the, the person receiving the goods sends money back in return. And so this is just an ordinary trade. What we would normally say is supply and demand. This is the supplier that's the producer, uh, the demander is the one receiving goods. Here's what's a little bit different when we start talking about foreign currency and, and foreign trade. Uh, here's what's different. If this is a person in the United States and uh, the other person's from Britain or I'll say United Kingdom, then these goods that the United States is selling to the, the British person, those are our exports. U.S. exports, I'll say. It's imports for Britain. Um, and then rather than the British person paying for those goods directly, uh, it works in a little bit of a roundabout way. Um, the reason that it has to be in a roundabout way is the American supplier or seller doesn't want British pounds. That's the currency that they have in Britain. And so uh, the way it works is like this. The British person, the consumer, um, the buyer, they send their pounds and that's the symbol for the pound, um, is sort of an L with that line through it. But they send their pounds to the foreign exchange market. And that's where they trade their pounds for dollars, and then the dollars are sent to the United States. Okay, so the real key here for understanding what's going on is that in the foreign exchange market, there is a, an exchange of one currency for another, and, there's, and we'll get to this later on in the hour, there's really supply and demand that's taking place that determines the value of the pound relative to the dollar and the do value of the dollar relative to the pound. These foreign exchange markets, and, and I don't mean to say just the foreign exchange market between dollars and pounds, but all foreign exchange markets um, do about one trillion dollars worth of trading per day. And so this is the most active market in the world. It's far more active than stock markets and bond markets and things like that. So this is a huge market. And what we want to do is we want to understand that and understand what determines the exchange rate between uh, dollars and pounds and dollars and the euro and dollars and yen. That would be uh, the Japanese currency and so forth. So uh, anyway, uh, we're going to start off talking about this exports and our imports and things like that and slowly build, develop uh, more and more complicated concepts and then finally we will arrive back at this supply and demand model uh, for the diagram. Um, uh, let me uh, sort of scoot over here and start doing this. Um, some of the terms that you're familiar with already, I mentioned exports and imports. Those are key ideas that we need to understand. Uh, most of the time when you'll hear people talking about exports and imports, uh, they're mainly thinking in terms of uh, physical goods, like we export cars or we export airplanes or we import computers and computer uh, chips and so forth. Uh, and in, in terms of tangible imports and exports, that's important, but we don't want to forget that there's also um, trade in services. Uh, and the reason we don't want to forget about that is the United States 
is a special, or it specializes in producing services, and the United States sells a lot of services overseas. Um, what we'll do is we will uh, do a, a certain type of an accounting as we go through. Uh, we'll have credits represented by a positive sign and debits in these accounts. Uh, we'll represent with a negative sign. Um, really what this refers to is anytime you see a credit, and this is in the U.S. accounts, but if you see a credit in the U.S. accounts, this means that funds are flowing into the U.S. If we see a debit, funds flow out of the U.S. And so if we can come back over to this example that I gave earlier, uh, where the United States exported uh, goods and services overseas, the foreigner receives that, and then the foreigner has to send dollars um, to the United States. Uh, this is dollars coming into the United States. It's a credit in our accounts, and then we would show that, uh, as I say, with a positive sign. Um, if we reverse the arrows, and we don't actually have to draw another diagram to do this, but if we reverse the arrows where goods were coming into the United States and funds were flowing back to Britain, then what we would have is this would be a debit in the U.S. accounts, and dollars would be flowing out of the United States and going to foreign exchange markets. So um, you can kind of keep those general concepts in mind of these debits and credits uh, because what we're going to do at the end is we're going to add up all the credits and subtract all the debits and then we'll have a net figure that is going to be called the balance of payments. Let me say that again just in case I've gotten by you a little bit quickly. We're going to add up all the credits. We're going to subtract off all the debits in, in all of the flows of, of funds between countries. And then when we've got all the credits and all the debits taken into account, then the final bottom line figure is balance of payments. And what we're going to find out is that this has to equal zero. Uh, that is to say the credits and the debits will have to balance. Uh, but more on that later, just to kind of let you see where we're going before we get started. Um, when we talk about this balance of payments, we've got four things that go into it. And by the way, sometimes I'll use this BOP as balance of payments. Uh, this is the most broad measure of uh, international financial activity, so you'll be hearing about this for the rest of your life. Um, as I say, it includes four things. The balance on current account. the balance on the capital account, official reserve balance, and something called the statistical discrepancy. Let me just mention about that statistical discrepancy and then we, we won't talk about it anymore. Uh, the statistical discrepancy is really this. Um, there are funds that flow, and, and also goods, but funds that flow across borders that we just don't measure very well, that we don't see them go. The United States government isn't able to measure them. And so then at the end, what we do is we have something that's really just an error term. And uh, this is not huge, but sometimes it's a pretty substantial number. Um, Another thing I'll mention to you is that the, this is, I'll say, small, the official reserve balances, which is the United States government holdings of, um, of gold and foreign currencies and things like that, uh, this is pretty small also. And so most of the action takes place with uh, respect to the first two uh, items there. The um, the balance on current account and the balance on capital account. That's where most of the action is. So we want to spend most of our time talking about those. I'll spend a little time talking about the official reserve accounts. And uh, statistical discrepancy, we won't be doing any more with that other than now we've recognized just what that is, is just sort of an error term. Um, uh, so anyway, let's get started. What do we mean by balance on current account? In general, but it's not very specific just to give this general definition, but in general what we mean by the balance on current account, this is a trade in goods and services. And there's a little bit more to be added to that, but uh, let me come up here and give a list. 
This is exports of goods. which is a credit in our accounts. When we, the United States, export goods, we get paid uh, funds from overseas. And so uh, the positive side means funds are flowing into the United States. Uh, exports of services. What kind of services could these be? Well, for example, uh, insurance services. If a United States insurance company insures a foreign ship or a foreign airplane, then uh, American insurance companies charge for that service, and this would be an export of services from the United States, or by the United States. And when we export our services, we get paid by the foreigners. Uh, income from U.S. assets overseas. Um, What's happening in this particular case, U.S. assets overseas, for example, suppose I owned a home in Mexico City and rented it to people, and then they paid me uh, once a month, they paid rent, uh, let's say $100 a month rent. So then over the course of a year, I would have received $1,200 uh, for renting my home that is a U.S. asset overseas. And by the way, when we say U.S. assets, I don't mean to say that the United States government owns it, but Americans own these assets. Could be the government, but more likely somebody in the private sector. So the income that we receive from that, there's another credit in our accounts. Uh, my home, my assets are, are services being provided to other people. They have to pay us for those. That's the first part of this. Uh, the second part, uh, we've got uh, imports of goods into the United States. When we receive goods, we have to pay for those goods and pay the foreigners for the goods. And so funds are flowing out of the United States. It's a debit on our accounts. Imports of services. Again, we pay for those. It's a debit in our accounts. And then payments. Um, to foreign assets. in the United States. That is to say, suppose a person in Mexico owned a house in uh, Los Angeles and rented that, and every uh, month the person in Los Angeles sent a check to that person in Mexico for the use of the house, then dollars would be leaving the United States, and that being the case, we would record that as a uh, debit. Anyway, so you can see these exports and imports. That's most of the uh, current account. We have one more item to add, which is net unilateral transfers abroad. This can be either a positive or a negative number. That is to say, it can either be a credit or a debit. It depends on which way the, the funds are going most rapidly and in the greatest volume. Um, what a unilateral transfer refers to, in a different way of saying this, this would be a gift. Uh, let's suppose that you've got a cousin living in France and you wrote uh, a check for $100 and sent it to the cousin, then you'd be uh, engaging in a unilateral transfer abroad. And then dollars would be leaving the United States and we rec record that uh, outflow of funds as a debit. On the other hand, if your cousin in France wrote you a check, then there would be an inflow of funds and we would record that as a credit for the United States and funds would be coming into the United States. Um, some other types of, things, uh, types of things that would go in here, grants, for example, the United States government gives grants overseas. Uh, here's one that happens more often than you might think. Uh, an American retires and moves uh, to another country, and then we send their Social Security check to them at the end of each month, or I guess at the start of each month. And so uh, the Social Security check leaving the United States, going to that other country, that would be an outflow of funds from the United States, and we record that as a debit. Um, for the most part, or every year that I'm aware of, the United States has transferred, the United States, the government, as well as citizens, have transferred more funds overseas than we have received. Uh, we don't receive a lot of foreign aid, but we give a certain amount of it. So uh, for the most part, if you look through history, what you'll find is a bunch of debits uh, for this final item. And so uh, that's the way I'm going to leave it in here. But it, it certainly could be a positive number. I'm just saying that that positive number, even though it's possible in theory, we don't really observe that in practice. So we've got these three different categories, um, if you like, to, to add up. And when we put all those together,
what we end up with is this balance on current account. Let's just take a second and I'll shoot a few numbers up here from a recent year so you can get an idea of the magnitudes of the numbers we're talking about. Uh, for example, exports of goods um, in a recent year, 19, I'm looking back at 98, uh, 1998, some good numbers are available for that year, uh, have been revised and so forth. Uh, 671 billion dollars were U.S. exports in that particular year. Okay, and in that same year, uh, our imports were 919 billion dollars. And so what you can see uh, in this particular instance, we're selling less than $700 billion worth of goods to foreigners, and they are selling more than $900 billion worth of goods to us. And so there's about a $240 billion um, deficit, is the terminology that we would use, in just our trade balance. Uh, and, and by the way, I'll bring these down. Every once in a while, you'll hear about a term called the balance of trade. And all it really refers to is just these two items netted out against each other. Uh, it's merchandise trade would be a more specific uh, terminology here. Uh, the balance of merchandise trade, the goods, not services, but just the tangible goods. Um, and in this particular case, there would be a deficit for the United States of about, what I say, $240 billion. And we put a negative there. The, uh, the debits exceed the credits, and so that's why we say there's a deficit. A lot of people make a big deal of this. I don't particularly think it's uh, all that important, but uh, since so many people do think it's important, you should be aware of it. Uh, this balance of merchandise trade is sometimes thought to be an indicator of how efficient the United States factories and workers are compared to others. And so uh, what you would hear somebody say is, well, we've got a big deficit in our balance of uh, trade, and that being the case, U.S. industry is not very efficient, and U.S. workers aren't very efficient. Uh, we're not able to compete successfully. We can't sell as many goods to foreigners as they're selling to us. Um, that's not um, altogether convincing. There's some uh, grain of truth in all that, but there's also some flaws in that way of, of thinking. Uh, what it does, number one, is it leaves out services, which are very important as well. And, uh, you know, if you, there's always going to be, if you just pick out two of these items and just focus on that, we're either going to have a positive number or a negative number, but um, if you pick on some that the United States is not particularly um, great at, uh, you know, in that, in that certain category, then it's going to look like uh, there's some problem with the United States. But there's other things going on here as well. We import oil, for example, because we consume a lot of oil, and we can't produce enough for ourselves. And that has nothing to do with the efficiency of our workers. It has to do with what's underground in a particular country. And uh, so, anyway, uh, we just don't want to get too hung up on this. Let me put a couple of other numbers up here. Exports of services in that same year, uh, $260 billion. Exports, or imports, I'm sorry, of services, $182 billion. And so in this particular case, there's nobody that talks about the balance of service trade, but uh, in this particular instance, what we would have is a surplus amounting to a, uh, almost $80 billion. So uh, anyway, there's a couple of numbers for you, and uh, I'll come back and present a couple more of these uh, later on. I, I did want to mention where you can see these numbers if you're interested. Uh, every month, the, um, uh, the, what is it, the Department of Commerce uh, puts out uh, something called the Survey of Current Business, and back in the back they have tables, and in those tables uh, you can run across a large number of, uh, of different economic data. For example, gross domestic product, which we talked about earlier in the semester. Um, and also these international accounts. So anyway, balance of trade. Uh, let me get this out of my, off the picture so we don't get ourselves confused by that anymore. Um, so as I was saying earlier, and I won't go through and try and fill in all these because there are, really is a page of 70 or 80 numbers as you go down it, but um, all these things that have to do with us exporting goods and services and receiving income from our assets that are working for us and, and providing services to foreigners, those are credits. We have debits when we import goods, import services, and receive the services from foreign assets. And then, of course, as I say, from our gifts to foreigners, um, we have a negative number um, 
in most years for our unilateral transfers. This balance on current account in that same year uh, was minus, that is to say, a deficit of $233 billion. That is the entire current account deficit. So let's turn to this uh, capital account next. When we talk about the capital account, again, we're talking about imports and exports, but of a different type. Now what the imports and exports of, when we talk about the capital accounts, it's imports and exports of financial assets and loans and that type of thing. So um, let's discuss that just a little bit. On the, um, the capital account, we've got inflow of of currency into the United States uh, to pay for U.S. financial assets uh, businesses Uh, et cetera, other types of things of that nature, a golf course or something like that, uh, and loans to the United States. So if currency is flowing into the United States, we record that as a deficit in these accounts. I'm sorry. A credit. Currency is flowing into the United States. And then flowing out is uh, there's an outflow of currency. To pay for foreign financial assets. Companies. Etc., and loans to foreigners. We're sending our money overseas in this particular instance, and since uh, funds are flowing overseas, then we record this as a uh, as a credit. Uh, I'm sorry, as a deficit, as a debit. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Credit, debit. Funds are flowing out of the country, and so we record that as a debit in our accounts. Uh, we add all the credits together, we subtract all of the debits, and then we get the net amount, which is the balance on capital account. The balance on capital account in that same year that we were talking about before uh, is a positive, or was, I should say, a positive two hundred and sixty six billion dollars. Let me come back over and write that down here. Now let's just take one second and think about what this is telling us is that the United States is buying lots of goods from foreigners. We already saw this. We're buying more goods from foreigners than they're buying from us goods and services and so we're running a deficit of about two hundred and thirty three billion dollars. Okay. On the other hand, uh, foreigners like to invest in the United States and like to uh, hold U.S. stocks and bonds. They like to make loans in the United States. They like to buy companies in the United States, golf courses and, and things like this. And so foreigners like investing their funds in the United States so much that they send us $266 billion in that particular year. Okay, so these are the two big accounts, and then the official reserve account, um, uh, as I mentioned before, this refers to basically the holdings of the United States government uh, and the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, but uh, the United States government holdings of certain assets, and uh, these assets would include uh, gold, foreign exchange, and something called uh, uh, special drawing rights, which are um, really just credits with the, uh, the International Monetary Fund. You don't really need to know about that in order to get through this material. The important thing to know is that this is the government's 
activities that we're talking about here. Uh, and the idea is if the government obtains more gold or more foreign exchange or more SDRs, the government has to pay for that. And so if, if these things go up, if government's holdings increase of gold or foreign exchange or SDRs, when that happens and the government gets more of those assets, the government has to pay for them. And how do they pay? And the answer is they pay by handing over dollars. And so when the government's holdings of gold in foreign exchange and special drawing rights goes up, we record that as a debit in these uh, international accounts because, as I say, the government has to pay. If the government would hand over gold to somebody else or hand over foreign exchange or hand over SDRs, then when the government hands those over and reduces its holdings of those particular assets, our government would be paid, and when the government gets paid, then that would be a credit in these accounts. Uh, as I told you earlier, there's very little activity nowadays in these uh, official reserve accounts, and so uh, even though I'm telling you about it right now, and you should be familiar with it, uh, for the most part, there's not much activity in this account. Uh, it's a few billion dollars. Let me just mention to you why this would happen. Why does the government have more or less gold, uh, you know, and, and change the amount of its gold holdings or uh, the amount of its foreign exchange holdings or special drawing rights? Uh, and the answer is that when the government is trying to intervene in currency markets, uh, let's say that the government officials say, oh, you know, the, the exchange rate between dollars and pounds is wrong. We wish, uh, not wrong, but, but not where we'd like it to be. We want that exchange rate to go up or we want it to go down. That's when our government would intervene in those markets and start doing something like taking, they've got a holding of pounds, uh, British pounds, taking some of their pounds, going to the foreign exchange market and say, here, we want to trade these pounds, give us back dollars. And so that activity by our government would change exchange rates and cause that rate of exchange between dollars and pounds to, to vary. And so um, anyway, what I'm telling you is, is that these activities are very small now because for the most part, the United States government does not intervene in these currency markets. For the most part, the government just says, well, whatever supply and demand determines uh, the exchange rate to be, that's fine with us. We don't really have a point of view on that. Now, this is really quite a change from the past. Uh, up until 1973, our government tried to keep fixed exchange rates, and so any time that uh, the forces of supply and demand, that is to say, the flow of currency in and out of the country for, on capital account, and the flow of currency in and out of the country on current account, any time that would change in the past, uh, or be large amounts in the past, and cause exchange rates to start moving either up or down, our government would say, oh no, we can't have that, we want a fixed exchange rate, and so then the government would get into these uh, foreign exchange markets, and they would have very active uh, official reserve accounts. In 1973, uh, it was then President Nixon, and he said, well, you know, we're not going to do that anymore. And so that was just the end of uh, the United States uh, intervening in these currency markets in a big way. Uh, then after President Nixon uh, came along Ford and Carter, Ford and Carter continued to uh, uh, intervene in these markets uh, to a certain extent, still several billion dollars a year of activity and trying to manipulate these uh, exchange rates. If not, keep them in one spot, at least not let exchange rates just go up and down according to market forces. And so uh, throughout the 1970s, uh, what we observed was that these official reserve accounts were not small, still pretty big, but just not as big as they had been in earlier years. In 1980, President uh, Reagan, not then President, but Governor Reagan then, then he became President Reagan, he took office and one of his first acts was to tell the Treasury, stop intervening in these currency markets. Whatever supply and demand says that the exchange rate ought to be, that's what it's going to be. Um, President Reagan uh, was shot uh, early in his first term, and uh, I think after he'd just been in office for a couple months. And when he was shot, there was a big sort of panic, and uh, the Treasury got into these markets and did a certain amount of trading in order to stabilize the dollar's value. But that was, to my knowledge, the biggest intervention by the Reagan administration in these foreign currency markets. Um, after just a day or so of that, the, um, the news came out President Reagan was going to be all right. And so after uh, uh, that one shock went by, uh, you know, of oh, the panic of what's going to happen, then um, the United States got out of these currency markets and has done very little since then. Every once in a while, you'll hear about uh, some 
uh, activity, some operation by the Treasury or the Federal Reserve to try and intervene in currency markets. But now those opportunities to, or those uh, events are few and far between. So nowadays, what we're talking about, as I mentioned earlier, is that almost all of the action takes place in these first two categories, balance on current account, balance on capital account. These other numbers, uh, and by the way, I told you this earlier, how the balance of payments, uh, this, this final number has to be equal to zero. And so if we took all of these different positive and, the num uh, and negatives and put them all together, they would sum up to zero. Okay, this is the balance of payments. B-O-P, balance of payments, equals zero, meaning the negatives and the positives and whatever these other numbers are, they all have to add up and offset each other. Well, you can see that um, these are within $33 billion of each other, the capital account and the current account, and so uh, there's only $33 billion in both of the other two. And uh, so what I want to do in what follows the rest of our discussion is I want us to just assume that we can ignore these, um, uh, these last two categories, the official reserve account and the statistical discrepancy. We'll just put those to the side. I'm not telling you that you don't have to be aware of them, that you don't have to know about them, but for the analysis that comes, and we're going to do some supply and demand and things like that, uh, we're going to leave this out. Uh, this number three and number four, we're going to leave these out of here just because they are so small and by including them we don't help ourselves understand uh, very much about exchange rates. So why don't I get started with that. The first thing we have to do is introduce uh, an idea that's a little bit alien to us. Always before when I draw supply and demand, it would be supply and demand for some good or supply and demand for some service. But now we're going to be drawing supply and demand for currency. And let's put here a quantity of dollars. And I don't mean to say this is the money supply in the United States. I mean to say quantity of dollars in foreign exchange markets. On the vertical axis, we'll put the price of dollars. Hmm, now what's the price of a dollar? And the answer is the price of a dollar is a dollar. Uh, that's if you're buying it with another dollar. But that's not what we're interested in here either. We're interested in the value of the dollar, the price of the dollar relative to other currencies. Uh, and there's only really one way of doing this, and let's just pick out one other currency and talk about the price of the dollar relative to, let's say, the pound. So um, uh, the terminology or the symbols that we'll use will look like this, the pound sign divided by dollars. This is number of pounds per dollar. Uh, for example, if there was a dozen eggs for a dollar, then you'd write eggs per dollar, and this is pounds per dollar. That's the value of the, of the pound. Um, I'm sorry, the value of the dollar. And uh, let's just take an example. Let's just say that um, it took two dollars to buy one pound. then if we want to know how valuable is a dollar, put a price on the dollar, what we'd say is, we could divide by two. So one dollar is worth one half pound. Okay, and that's really what we're going to put on this vertical axis is, uh, uh, is a measure like this, pounds per dollar. And so pounds per dollar, um, uh, let me give another example. Suppose that uh, the, price of one, or, uh, the price of a pound, I'm a little bit jerky here, it's hard for me to think in terms of pounds, uh, uh, but the price of a pound in terms of a dollar, let's say it was one to one. That would be a more valuable dollar because, uh, a more valuable dollar than before. A moment ago, that dollar's value was only a half of a pound. And so now the value of that dollar is one pound. And so um, uh, as the exchange rate changes, we're going to have different numbers along this vertical axis. Okay? And, and this might be the one half of a pound per dollar and the one pound per dollar and so forth. Okay? Now what we want to do is we want to put supply and demand in our diagram. Uh, let me draw a supply curve to begin with. This is the supply of dollars, 
in foreign exchange markets. This is when Americans are handing over dollars, trying to get rid of dollars because they want something else. This corresponds to debits that we were talking about before in those balance of payments uh, accounts, each one of the categories of balance on current account. So every time that an American imports a good or imports a service or invests overseas, then the American, by importing the good or importing the service or buying the financial asset overseas and paying for it, then the American is supplying dollars in foreign exchange markets. Okay, Here's a demand for dollars. Demand for dollars in foreign exchange markets. Who's demanding dollars? Well, and the answer is foreigners are. It's foreigners that want to buy American cars or airplanes or movies and things like this. And so the demand for dollars in foreign exchange markets, that's when somebody's trying to buy a dollar and they are buying dollars so they can send them to the United States. And they do that when the United States has these credits in the balance of payments accounts. And just in general terms, I could come back over here and say, gee, we're supplying a lot of dollars um, on this uh, current account due to the fact that we import more goods and services than we export, then we are sending funds overseas and we've got a lot of these debits uh, represented by the supply of dollars. I'll put a little dollar sign down here. And then on the other hand, foreigners like to invest in the United States. We see on the capital accounts a big surplus, a big positive number. And so they are trying to buy dollars so they can send them to the United States to participate in our stock and bond market and so forth. And so you could think of this uh, as sort of the demand for dollars due to activity in our capital accounts, supply of dollars due to activity in our, our current accounts. That's a simple way of thinking about it. And then what we have is an equilibrium exchange rate. And what it comes down to is basically the desirability of buying American goods and services and uh, making investments in the United States versus Americans buying goods and services over overseas and um, investing overseas. And um, uh, the thing is though, Follow me here with this. Since the balance of payments, all of these items added together, the credits and the debits, all have to balance each other and add up to zero. And if we just assume that the uh, official reserve accounts and statistical discrepancy equals zero, just because they are small numbers, then what we can see is that the debit in the current account and the surplus, I should say credits, in the capital account, those things have to equal each other approximately. They have to e equal each other. Now, who cares? And here's who cares. And it was something I didn't really bring up earlier when I started talking about this topic. Sometimes people, will, again, they'll say, oh, you know, the United States is not very efficient at producing goods and services, not as efficient as foreigners, and here's our proof, we're buying more goods and services from them than they buy from us. You know, there's something to be said for that point of view, of view but here's something I think that trumps that claim, and it's this. Whatever is happening in our current accounts, if, we, if foreigners love to invest in the United States, and let me make this clear that foreigners do love to invest in the United States. If foreigners love to invest in the United States, we are going to run a surplus in our capital accounts. We're going to have a big credit in those capital accounts. And then, since these third and fourth items we can ignore, we must have a deficit in that capital, or a current account, I beg your pardon. We must have a deficit in a current account to balance these off. We cannot have a positive number in both categories. The negatives and the positives, and they have to add to zero. And so, there's two different ways of looking at this. Uh, number one, which I don't really find very persuasive, this number on the current account is negative. This balance on our current account is negative because we're lousy at producing goods and services. We produce goods and services nobody wants. That's one interpretation. I'm not persuaded by that. Here's the interpretation I place on it. 
we are a marvelous place to invest, and, and that, by the way, that's for a variety of reasons. One is uh, that American industry is going through a uh, uh, really a sort of a new industrial revolution. It's this uh, information revolution that we're going through. Uh, computers, internet, telecommunications, all the things that have been occurring for the last few years and will continue in the next few years. Um, we're going through that. There's a lot of companies making huge profits. This is a wonderful, wonderful place to, uh, to invest. That's part of what's going on. Part of what's going on is U.S. taxes, even though we sometimes consider them high, U.S. taxes are um, pretty moderate compared to taxes in many other countries. And so if foreigners are worried about paying taxes, then there's a likelihood that they're going to send their dollars to the United States or their funds to the United States to invest. And so that's the second part of the story. Um, so for whatever reasons, and there are others that we could talk about, um, the United States is a great place to invest, so we run a big surplus in this capital account, and then it is necessary by the nature of uh, the accounts and by the way that the foreign exchange markets work, it is just absolutely necessary that whatever surplus we run on the capital account must be balanced by a deficit in the uh, current account. And uh, that's more or less the way I see this uh, working out for the last several years. And so therefore, I don't find any sort of alarming trend underway that we have a, uh, a deficit in our current accounts. Uh, it's basically what happens is the, all the funds flowing into the United States to make investments here drive up exchange rates. We'll talk about it in a moment. And then at the higher exchange rates, we're not able to sell so many foreign goods and services. Uh, let's put it another way, though. Let's say the United States could just turn off the spigot and say, no more investment here in the United States by foreigners. If the, the money stopped flowing in from foreigners, this capital account would turn into a zero. There'd be no deficit and no surplus. And at that point, uh, the current accounts would equal zero. That is to say, our exports of goods and services would exactly equal our, ex our imports of goods and services, and we'd have no deficit. So um, anyway, I guess what I'm telling you is don't get awfully concerned uh, when you see these uh, newspaper reports or television news reports about how we're running this big trade deficit. Uh, in my opinion, that's just not something to be alarmed about. Okay, uh, what I want to do is divide this, um, this diagram into two parts and sort of discuss it um, a little bit more in depth. Let's put one diagram here. Uh, this would be the value of the dollar in terms of pounds and the quantity of dollars. And what we'll just talk about here is the balance on current account. Okay, so what I'm saying to you is there's a supply and demand for dollars by people who invo are involved in trade and goods and services and then this other item that we talked about where there's uh, income flowing back and forth for the use of certain assets. Okay, so if all, that's all we're interested in, here's what we would say. As the dollar gets more and more valuable, as it moves up in value, foreigners, uh, let's not talk about foreigners, Americans buy more and more from overseas. And that's what this diagram is showing us. It says this, and, and don't forget, this supply curve is a supply of dollars by Americans. We're, we're getting rid of dollars, handing those over. Here's what we're saying, is if the dollar is weak and not very valuable, then it takes a lot of dollars to buy goods from overseas. Uh, a British car, for example, uh, that cost a thousand pounds would cost a lot of dollars if the dollar is weak, if the dollar's value is not very high. And so since it costs a lot of dollars, we don't import many of those dollars, and therefore uh, we're not sending many dollars, I'm sorry, we don't import many cars, and so we would not send many dollars overseas. As the dollar gets stronger and stronger, that is to say as its value goes higher and higher, then that 1,000 pound car, pound sterling, that 1,000 pound car, that gets cheaper and cheaper in terms of, of United States dollars. And now what we want to do is we want to buy more and more of those cars. So at a very expensive dollar, a very valuable dollar, what we would say is, wow, those British cars sure are cheap. Let's buy a lot of them. And since we're saying let's buy a lot of them, now we are supplying lots of dollars. We're buying a lot of cars. 
Okay. So anyway, this curve right here is showing us the willingness of Americans to buy goods and services uh, from foreigners. The stronger our dollar is, the more we want to buy from foreigners, the more we want to travel overseas on vacation and so forth. Okay. It works in exactly the opposite direction when we start talking about British consumers or foreign consumers of U.S. goods. If the dollar gets stronger and stronger and stronger as we go higher and higher in this diagram, foreigners find U.S. goods more and more expensive, and the more expensive U.S. goods are, the more they want to buy. And so with, the, uh, with respect to the demand for dollars in these currency markets, there's a smaller quantity demanded the more valuable the dollar is because the more valuable dollar makes our goods more expensive and something that foreigners just start saying, well, uh, at an expensive dollar, I think I won't buy a U.S. car. I think I'll buy a car from Germany or I'll buy a car from Japan. Okay. So anyway, we've got supply and demand. And let me kind of clean my diagram up here just a little bit. But we've got supply and demand for dollars that uh, reflect only the current account, trade in goods and services. Okay. Now what we've got is a, another supply and demand diagram that refers to the, the capital accounts. Let me get my uh, everything drawn up here. So when we talk only about the capital accounts, what we want to do is, again, draw supply and demand. What we'd say is uh, Americans want to invest overseas, and so we are supplying our dollars to buy foreign currencies to make those foreign investments. Uh, and that's what this curve reflects. And really what we're saying is the more valuable the dollar is, the more we want to buy overseas stocks and bonds and buildings and, and so forth, businesses. And the reason we want to do that is because the stronger the dollar, the cheaper those foreign goods and services are. And then foreigners, I'm going to draw this where it's pretty high, but foreigners have a demand for U.S. dollars uh, when they want to invest here in our stocks and bonds and things of that nature. And uh, if the dollar gets, uh, let's say in this particular case, the dollar gets cheaper and cheaper, less and less valuable compared to uh, the uh, English currency, then uh, uh, British investors want to invest more here. And so as the dollar gets cheaper, as we go down the diagram, there's more and more investment within the United States. That is to say, moving in the rightward direction. Quantity demanded of dollars is increasing. Well, here's what you can see by just kind of glancing at these two diagrams side by side. And we should have these drawn on the same horizontal plane. But what you can see is that there's a certain exchange rate that would be equilibrium if we were only interested in the capital account trade or business. There's a different exchange rate that would be the equilibrium rate if we only look at the, uh, the current accounts. But the exchange rate, the overall exchange rate, takes both of these things into account. It incorporates both pieces of information. And that is to say, the, you know, the current account and the capital account. Just so there's no mistake, again, this is not the current account and this is the capital account. This is the amount of currency coming into the United States and out of the United States. Here's out of the United States, into the United States, due to trade in the, in the current account. Here's the currency flowing out of the United States and into the United States due to trade that's taking place uh, in these financial securities and our capital accounts. The overall exchange rate is uh, halfway, so to speak, in between these other two exchange rates. That is to say, the equilibrium exchange rate, which corresponds to what we've been talking about up to now, that shows us the exchange rate that will equilibrate both of these markets simultaneously, in a, in a manner of speaking. And so what we have is a deficit in the current account, and we have a surplus in the capital accounts. And the size of this surplus is approximately equal to the size of the deficit. The size of the surplus in the capital accounts equal to the size of the surplus in the current accounts. And therefore, we then find a, an exchange rate that equilibrates the deficit in the one account and the surplus in the other, or if you like, the, uh, the credits and the debits 
uh, are equal. So what you don't want to do is let this uh, disturb you, these accounts that are telling us about the bad news, uh, oh, we're running a deficit. Yes, we are running a deficit. Tell me the rest of the story. Tell me about the surplus we're running in the capital accounts. I guess finally what we want to do, almost finally, is we want to talk about uh, some things that will shift these curves. Um, let's say, for example, that there is a difference in, um, I don't exactly know where I'm going to write. Maybe I'll write right down here. Uh, let's say that there's a difference in income growth between the U.S. versus uh, U.K., Britain. Let's see how that would, ex uh, would affect this. Let's say the United States income is growing uh, at 5% a year, and these are real incomes, not nominal. Let's say U.S. income is growing 5% a year, and British income is growing 1% a year, and that's just to pick a couple numbers out uh, for purposes of illustration. If that happens, here's what happens to these accounts. The United States income is going up rapidly. We start buying more and more goods from foreigners. We buy more goods from ourselves as well, but we're buying more and more goods from foreigners. Whereas foreigners are buying a little bit more goods from us, but not very much because uh, their incomes are not growing as much, not growing as rapidly. So this rapid growth in U.S. income, that causes us to import more goods and services. That causes our, where are we here, our current accounts to worsen. Maybe this number goes down to 240 billion or 250 billion or something like that. And so now what happens is the supply of dollars increases, S2. And as the supply of dollars increases, what you can see is that deficit's going to get larger for the United States. And that will bring down the exchange rate. Here's how we can see that over in our main diagram. Uh, the supply of dollars has increased to S2, and so now the U.S. dollar would weaken. Okay, so if our income growth exceeds that in foreign countries, that's going to cause the dollar to weaken, all other things being the same. Let's try something else. Uh, let's say that there's a difference in inflation rates. Now, I won't try and draw all the diagrams to go along with it, but let's say the United States has a higher inflation rate than the foreign country, and that means our goods and services are going up more rapidly in price than the foreign goods and services. And that being the case, foreigners are going to find our goods less and less desirable now that we have this inflation that exceeds theirs. And so we are going to import more goods from overseas, we're going to export fewer goods, and we'll have exactly the same kind of an effect that we showed earlier on. A third thing that could happen is that there could be uh, an increase in this difference between uh, real interest rates. Uh, how am I going to describe this? Difference in real interest rates in the U.S. versus U.K. If our interest rate goes up and foreign interest rates do not go up, what will happen then? If our interest rates go up, foreigners then will say, oh, there's a great place to send our money. Interest rates are higher in the United States, and so dollars start flowing into the United States. And when that happens, this number will increase to $280 billion or something of that nature. And so that will cause, uh, what will it do? It will cause this curve to shift to the right, to D prime. And if we came back over and shifted the demand curve uh, outward, that would make the dollar go up in value. Now, I, we don't need to go through each and every one of these. I'll let you read about it in your textbook. But the point is, is that we found an equilibrium exchange rate. And now what we want to understand is that that equilibrium exchange rate will change over time as economic conditions change in the various countries. And so people who speculate in these foreign exchange markets are constantly watching things like real interest rates and, and inflation reports coming out of the various nations. We also have policies, our government does, that will affect these accounts. Suppose the government says, you may not import any more uh, cars produced in Japan. Uh, that would be called a quota. Or suppose they put a big tax on cars imported from overseas. That would be a tariff. Well, that tariff and quota, that would discourage our uh, purchases of foreign goods, which would then shift uh, the current account 
and, and cause these curves to, to shift in a corresponding way and exchange rates would change. So uh, what we want to understand is that the foreign exchange market and the exchange rates taking into account economic conditions and economic policy uh, around the world. Uh, let me finally say that um, uh, back in the old days, exchange rates were fixed uh, by law, the government intervened in these currency markets to keep exchange rates at a fixed level. Essentially, that's what the gold standard referred to. That's what the euro is in Europe, where they, they maintain uh, fixed exchange rates with respect to each other's nations. Um, even though the euro is a sort of a new thing and um, uh, just been going now for a few years, even though we've got the euro, uh, that is sort of bucking the trend. The trend in the world economy is to have flexible exchange rates and for this supply and demand diagram to be the one that um, we need if we want to understand international finance. Uh, I guess that will finish up for the day and next time we'll be uh, having the semester review and then the final exam. So long, I'll see you next time.